Hey everyone, welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. For today's video, I'm going to take a quick look at the Sinclair ZX Spectrum that I brought back from England with me on my recent trip. If you haven't seen my last video, that's where I show the computers I brought back. Uh, you can look in the description for a link or I'll put one at the top of the video on either side, I can't remember which. Before I do that, I want to talk quickly about the BBC microcomputers. I have them both on the workbench and they're roughly assembled. Since the last video, I've actually kind of reinstalled all the parts, although things are mixed up a bit between the two of them, but I've installed plugs on both of the cords. Now where we left off, one of the two power supplies wasn't putting out the minus 5 volts. This was the power supply that was in the computer with the clean keyboard and the hole in the case, the one I just took off. When I powered it up in England, I didn't hear any sound, or I could just very faintly hear the sound through the speaker. And I found that when I put the power supply with the minus 5 volts in either of the computers with the matching motherboard, the sound worked fine on both of the computers. So that definitely pointed to the minus 5 volts missing as a reason for the audio not to work. It kind of makes sense. Usually op amps or the amps that drive the speakers need plus and minus volts to work properly. And since it was missing half of its voltage, probably what was going wrong. There were a couple people who commented about that in the comment section, and I think you were absolutely right. Now, this was the actual power supply that was giving me problems, and watch, when I turn this computer on, we have fully functioning sound now. In fact, just for fun, I actually burned an EEPROM here of Arkanoid, and if I run it, we have totally working sound and working everything else as well. Now you might be asking, what did I do to fix the minus 5 volts? And I wish I could tell you, because I actually didn't do anything. I had the power supply out, and I was probing around, testing for why I wasn't getting minus 5 volts. Looking at the schematics for this power supply showed that the minus 5 volts actually comes right off of the transformer. It has a center tap for ground, and a plus 5 on one side and a minus 5 on the other. And it comes out of that, goes through an inductor, and just a couple passives, and that gives you the minus 5. Well, when I started poking around and testing, lo and behold, minus 5 was working again. So I have a hunch that there's a probability that maybe the transformer has a slight fault. Maybe one of the windings for the minus 5 has a little break in it or something. Definitely wasn't working when I was testing before. So not really sure what's going on exactly, but it's working again. Both of these computers have working minus 5 volts, which means they both have sound. It definitely bothers me when things just fix themselves without me understanding what was wrong because that means that this fault just might show up again in the future. There was one other tiny issue with the keyboard on the computer without the sound and a couple of the keys, notably 2 and E, weren't working. Well, I fixed both of those problems as well. The E key works fine, so does the 2 key. All I did was pop the key cap off and I put a little bit of deoxid around the key switch pushed it in and out a bunch of times. Lo and behold, they work fine, both of them now. In fact, it's kind of funny because Deoxin has a little bit of lubricant in it, so now the E key feels very smooth compared to the adjacent W and R keys next to it. So when I revisit these two computers, it's gonna be all about cleaning them up and getting them looking as nice as possible, plus probably putting in some extra features and new ROMs and cool mods and stuff like that. So look forward to that video coming up. All right, moving on to the Spectrum. I set this aside without any testing, and today we're gonna to take a look at this machine and see if I can get this working. So like I talked about in the last video, this machine is pretty filthy. A lot of gunk on the keyboard. There's a lot of glitter, like see these little white specks? I think those, oh no. Okay, that was actually scratching the paint right off. There was for some reason a lot of glitter on this, but then there's also a lot of corrosion on this front panel. But um, that's okay, I don't mind that this has some battle scars. We'll see if this machine even works before I decide what to do with it. So unlike the BBC Micro, which was rather expensive and pretty much found commonly in schools, the ZX Spectrum was a very popular home computer in the UK. Um, had this rather crappy rubber keyboard, at least the early versions like this did. I think the later revisions had actual hard keys that maybe were a little better to type on. Well, this was built down to a cost, and because of that, it's lacking a lot of ports. We have a 9-volt DC input. We have an edge connector here, expansion port, basically. Microphone, earphone, and a TV output. 
And I'm pretty sure when it says mic and ear, this is specifically to hook up a cassette drive or you could use your smartphone these days, but this would be a cassette drive to load and save your programs. TV is an RF output, which I won't be able to use here, but there's a simple mod that will change this over to composite, which I will have to do. And then yes, it's a regular DC and that is it. So if you wanted to say connect a joystick, you need to use an expansion uh, module that would plug in the back. I think Sinclair sold that for something like 20 pounds back in the day and it'd give you two ports plus a cartridge port. There were a certain amount of games released on cartridge. So let's crack this open. I just need to take these screws off, I think. The screws have a little bit of corrosion on them, a little rust. So maybe it was just stored in a damp UK basement or perhaps in someone's attic. All right, so there we go. Um, Got to unplug the keyboard here. Look at those keyboard connectors. It looks like they should just pull out. There we go. All right. So these appear to be in okay shape. I would imagine that these are common failure points. There's a memory under there that this keypad touches. It would be like a remote control or a calculator. So those ribbon cables probably can fail. So there's there's the ZX Spectrum. Wow, look at that. Quite a cool integrated unit. Issue two. Someone commented on my last video when they saw me taking this apart where they thought that this would be an issue two. There's a red sticker that's just lying there. And they were absolutely correct. They said the later issues were more reliable so I thought I read that these came in two different RAM sizes, 16K and 48K. And looking at this board, these appear to be RAM chips and so do these. These are 4116, so these are 16K. These eight chips total 16K. And these chips, maybe they appear to be 32K chips, so 8K for 32. I actually don't think I was actually aware that this type of chip existed. So nonetheless, um, I think this might be the 48K machine, which is good, because that's exactly what I was hoping it would be. But I gotta say, I, I was concerned based on the exterior appearance that this thing was gonna be rough on the inside with uh, corrosion and whatnot. But look at how shiny the RF modulator is and heat sink, there's really no dirt or dust in here. And this is looking really good. So this is an issue two board and the ULA is a 5C112E-3. It has what is known as the spider mod, that's the TR6 mod. It goes between two pins on the CPU and one of the pins on the ULA. It was to fix some kind of timing issue. I'm not too sure about if these machines were sold with 48K or they all were 16K and people added the memory afterwards. But looking at these chips here, they're from 83 and they seem to match the date codes on most of the other chips on this board. So it was either upgraded immediately upon purchase or this was manufactured as a 48K board. Looking at the back here, I would definitely say that these chips were not hand soldered, so this was probably manufactured this way. People can correct me in the comments if you know more about the configurations of these machines when they were made. So the RF modulator has basically a five volts and the video input wires. The one on the left is video input. And essentially the mod just involves removing the resistor that's connected to the RCA jack here and cutting this wire and running it through this hole and connecting it to that right there. So I'm going to perform that mod so we can test this out. All right, mod's complete. So you see I have the little red wire soldered onto the center pin of the RCA jack there. And I just cut the video input lead and ran through the extra hole there and bent the other lead out of the way. I could reverse this relatively easily. So the first thing I need to do is test the polarity of the DC input jack. Sometimes these are center negative, don't want to put the wrong polarity in. So I'm going to touch the RF modulator, which is grounded, and I'm going to test the center pin. So wow, okay, so this is center negative. So I will be giving nine volts from here. Let's just test that I am definitely getting center negative. So we'll put that on there. Turn the nine volts on. We should have plus nine volts. And we do. I do have the original brick for this Sinclair and it says it outputs 9 volts at 1.4 amps. So I'll be starting at a lower amperage than that. I'll probably start at 500 milliamps in case there's something short on here I don't want to blow it up. This is the DC regulator here, 7805 that regulates down to 5 volts. And the spectrum is interesting because you see here there's a coil. This is actually 
another power supply that takes the 5 volts and brings it up to plus 12 and then minus 12 and a minus 5. The reason for that is the 16K RAM chips right here actually use plus 5, plus 12, and minus 5 to work. So this little power supply actually makes that happen. All right, so I have everything connected. We have the Sony PVM, which supports PAL. The RF mod is done, so we're going to get composite out of this jack. I got the power supply connected with the polarity reverse, so center negative. Bench power supply is set at 500 milliamps at 9 volts, and let's power it on. Oh, look at that. Sinclair Research. Okay, it's working, but it's limiting the current right now, so it probably needs more power. So I'm going to shut this off, and I'm going to crank it up to 1 amps. Let's try that again. All right. Ah, so we were getting black and white before, but now the monitor says PAL, and I see a little bit of color here. The under voltage was causing an issue. Since this is really not showing up well on the camera due to the 50 hertz, let's switch over to the LCD using my HDMI converter. Well, this is annoying. Um, look at the output one hooked up to my HDMI converter box. It basically shows up as CCAM. Very odd. Well, since my converter box is not working properly with the Sinclair, I'm just going to show you on this monitor here running the camera at 50 hertz. So you can see booted up, it looks pretty good. Let me power cycle the machine again. So we get the boot screen and then the Sinclair Research. So looks pretty good. Okay, I just typed that program and it literally took me five minutes to do. <laughs> Let's run it. Run. Shift R. Or just it. <laughs> All right, well, it's working. Oh boy. I, I honestly can't imagine programming anything on this thing. <laughs> But I, I guess you get used to it. I mean, it has a lot of shortcuts, things like that. But, wow. Let's see if there's a way I can get colors to display. Well, <laughs> I attempted to put some color on the screen. It, it definitely looks a little weird. It's hard to see in here, but the blue and the red looks absolutely fine. But the yellow and cyan and, and the magenta has like weird kind of lines through it. See that? Alternating colors. Also the white is very much not that white. But wow, yeah, I gotta say, I'm absolutely chuffed. It's, this thing looks rough, but it actually works. I pushed all the keys and every key seems to be working properly. I'll still take this apart and really clean this up well, but there's actually not much to do to this machine other than clean it and perhaps adjust the video signal. Maybe a heat sink. Will a heat sink even fit? Yeah, the, ooh, ah, yeah, the ULA gets pretty darn warm. So I'm gonna stick a heat sink on that. I took a look at the video output on my oscilloscope and there was quite a large DC offset. So I've added a 100 microfarad decoupling cap in line with it there, which seems to have fixed the DC offset, kind of improved the picture quality a little bit. I also decided to add a little bit of a heat sink to the ULA, although I'm not really sure this actually does anything. So because of the profile of the case, I couldn't put heat sinks directly on top of the center of the chip, which is where the die is and it gets very hot. So I've cut a PC slot cover and I've adhesive so I cut a PC slot cover and use thermal adhesive to attach it to the ULA which should conduct the heat you know to the ends as well and I've put two small heat sinks on here which may have some effect I have no idea if this will actually do anything the entire computer doesn't run particularly warm other than the ULA and the heat sink here for the voltage regulator I also have one of my old Android phones connected to the computer, so I'm running Tap Dancer here, which is actually, I have Tap Dancer installed and running. This is a perfect app for loading tape files into these old 8-bit microcomputers. And I'm currently using this old Magnavox monochrome monitor. It actually works fine with PAL or NTSC. So we'll use this right now because it's small enough I can show it and the computer at the same time. Well, I've discovered a little bit of a problem with this computer. It is not working quite as well as I thought. It seems to be a little sick. Let me demonstrate. So we'll power up the Sinclair and I have a RAM test program loaded on here. We're gonna load this into memory. Well, all is not well with the ZX Spectrum. I was about to show you that 
using my phone, the computer was having some issues loading games. If I loaded very old, basic 16K programs, they generally seem to work. I'd occasionally get maybe a random character, a little corruption, the computer might freeze. But if I try to load anything that was 48K required, it would uh, usually say out of memory or would load and then the computer would crash. So I, lo I found a RAM test tape program and I loaded that up and tested it. But I'll get to that in a second because what's happening now is unfortunately the keyboard is no longer working. This ribbon cable on this side has given up the ghost. First, just some of the keys over here weren't working. I got this bottom row, but then eventually got to the point where this whole side of the keyboard wasn't working. Obviously, I can't load any programs when that's the case. You see save up here because I pushed S and that gave me save, but typing just got worse and worse. So with the keyboard not working, I can't show you what it was doing on camera, but I do have some photographs I took with my smartphone, which I'll show here. So what was happening is when I loaded the RAM test, almost always the initial 16K RAM test worked fine. But when I tested the upper 32K, it would always have errors and it would either show all eight chips as bad or five chips as bad. Occasionally I'd have graphical corruption while I was testing. It just was all over the place. And in fact, just earlier before I started recording, I ran it through one test cycle and as soon as I booted up the program, it did the testing, and when it got to the 48K, the computer started testing, it said failed, and then the computer rebooted. So I looked at some troubleshooting guides, and it said when you're having trouble with the upper 32K, these logic chips here are what drive these chips. These are optional chips that are required when you're adding the RAM. Well, I've scoped out all of the RAS and CAS and write enable lines here and the address multiplexers, and everything looks absolutely fine. I don't see any problems with any of this. Incidentally, what's really strange is while this is an Issue 2 board, looking at the schematics for the Issue 2, the chips aren't wired up in the same way according to the Issue 2 schematics. And just for fun, I checked the Issue 3 schematics, and that appears to be the way that this is wired up. Like, the pins for RAS and CAS and the address lines match up with the Issue 3 schematics, and they don't match with Issue 2. But as I kept testing, things actually seemed to get a little bit worse. And while the computer booted up, you saw it was at the boot screen there without any problem, trying to run programs just seems to cause random corruption and crashes. So I'm not really sure where the problem lies. I still think it's probably these 32K chips here. Maybe one of them is doing funky things on the data bus when they're being accessed, and that's causing these crashes. But as it is right now, I'm unable to do any further testing because I can't load the RAM test program without the keyboard. And without that, there's no way for me to validate if any of the fixes I do on this are actually helping. People have definitely commented that there are replacement membranes for the keyboard, and I assume that means that these get replaced with it as well. So where I'm at with this computer right now is that I don't really know what to do. Um, it could easily become a money pit. I could just start replacing parts and hopefully get this thing working. But but part of me says that might not be worth it. It's it's will be time consuming to get the parts for this thing to try to repair it. And it's just not in nice shape anyway. So is it even worth it for me to try to fix this? Or should I just cut my losses and try to find another ZX Spectrum that actually works? Anyway, if you have some tips and suggestions to give me, I'd love to see those in the comment section below. I read every comment. And you can subscribe for more videos, and thanks for watching my videos. I appreciate it. Bye!